All right, good morning. Welcome to today's lecture, ILM 310-303-BA, the first of two ILMs that introduce us to inorganic compounds. Um, we are looking into these two ILMs for the main purpose of gaining a basic knowledge of inorganic compounds so that we can understand how various liquid analyzers work. And as we know, liquid analyzers are a major component of the analyzer course here in third year. My PowerPoint is up on the screen, I trust? Yep. Perfect. All right. So our objectives today, uh, Three pretty simple objectives. Um, lots of uh, reading and terminology in this ILM uh, again, but just gives you the basic uh, the basic breakdown of inorganic uh, compounds um, and uh, how we start um, making different uh, compounds. So uh, objective one here described formation of compounds. So we'll talk about using those valence electrons. Um, in different types of bonding, which allows different elements to connect to each other. Uh, the second objective here is describing uh, oxidation, which again has to do uh, with those valence electrons. And objective three, describing simple and complex ions. Uh, and complex is kind of a misnomer because they're actually fairly simple ions uh, in this course, but the most complex ones that we are going to look at. So this, uh, this is the foundation of future modules. Uh, we're going to learn about different inorganic compounds, how to name them, and how to write their chemical formulas in a nutshell. So it sounds a lot more complicated than it uh, actually is. Okay, we'll start out by talking a little bit about compounds and defining a compound. We talked enough about elements in the previous ILMs. So compounds are pure substances that can be broken down into similar sub or simpler substances that contain fewer elements. Uh, in a nutshell, two or more different atoms combined in some fixed ratio make a compound. And this is the basis of all the chemical formulas that you may or may not be familiar with up to this point in, in life. But uh, common ones like H2O, H2O2, NaCl, sodium hydroxide, all of these are representations of combinations of elements which have come together to make a compound. And we are going to be looking at the uh, naming uh, and the construction of these formulas and, and how it works, what do these numbers mean, uh, and how we, can, uh, how we can write formulas based off of names and names based off of formulas. Long story short is when we're looking at a formula, really, it's just a recipe that tells us the ratio of one atom to the other. So water, for example, H2O has two hydrogens, one oxygen. Hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, is two hydrogens and two oxygens. When we don't see uh, a number here, we generally assume that there's a one. And because there's a one, uh, this is kind of a rule. We just don't write the, let the number one. We just assume uh, if there's no number that it just is the single uh, element that we see in the formula. Compounds are split into two categories. Uh, organic and inorganic. This section deals with the inorganic. We'll have another section, two ILMs, that will discuss organic chemistry later. Uh, the major difference between the two of them is that organics contain carbon-hydrogen bonds, whereas the inorganic ones that we are talking about today contain basically everything else uh, that does not have these carbon-hydrogen bonds. And we'll talk about those again, specifically in organic chemistry later, which is actually the major component of this course. There are also two types of bonds, uh, ionic and covalent. Um, you may remember this from uh, middle school or even high school, um, but this is uh, what we're going to be talking about next is these different types of bonds and how these compounds are formed, again, using the valence electrons. Okay, takes us into bonds. Uh, we mentioned on the previous slide ionic bonds. Ionic bonds hold ionic compounds together. Covalent bonds hold covalent compounds together, and that sounds simple enough. Um, and it is really actually quite simple, um, and we'll hopefully prove 
prove that to you before the end of this ILM. So in order to do this, they use those valence electrons that are on the outer shell. And in very general terms, actually in very useful terms for us in this course, uh, particularly uh, ionic bonds join metal and non-metal atoms, while covalent bonds join only non-metals. Again, if we were looking at the uh, periodic tables uh, that I've provided for you in course content, and again, I encourage you to go into course content and print off a copy of uh, each of them so that you have them handy. Uh, you will need them for exams and they are allowed uh, for exams. So uh, of particular interest today would be the periodic table of ions. Again, that you can find in course content and it's gonna tell us a lot uh, about the different elements that are in the compounds that we're gonna be looking at. Uh, again, speaking specifically to this slide, we're talking about uh, bonds ionic bonds which join metals and non-metals and again we defined metals and non-metals in the previous lecture um, as uh, having um, metals all on the left hand side of the periodic table of that staircase and all the non-metals on the right hand side of the periodic table or the right hand side of that staircase so a really good general rule that you can carry through the rest of this ilm uh, is that if the uh, elements in the compound uh, are made exclusively of things from the left, you can assume that they are ionic, or I mean, um, sorry, if they're made exclusively of things on the right, that is uh, the non-metals, we can assume that they're covalent compounds. And if they are a mixture of an element from the left-hand side and the right-hand side, that is a metal and a non-metal, that they will be ionic. And that is really the simplest and easiest way uh, to distinguish between the two of them. Uh, and that's simply by the elements in the compound. Okay, ionic bonds, we'll talk about uh, a little bit here and then we'll talk a little bit about covalent bonds. Uh, again, just as uh, background information that leads us up into uh, how we get to make the formulas. So ionic bonds form between two oppositely charged ions. Uh, ions get a charge if they lose or gain an electron. Uh, and that's the transition that we get going from the regular periodic table uh, that doesn't have any charges written on it to the ionic periodic table which you'll notice has uh, a charge uh, next to each element on it and this is a result um, of those elements giving up or gaining uh, electrons in order to um, make themselves happy and we'll talk about what defines uh, an element being uh, happy so two types of ions uh, the first is called a cation, which is a positively charged ion. The second type is a anion, which is a negatively charged ion. And when we're talking about ionic bonds, it's the classic opposites attract theory. We have uh, an uncharged metal ion, which loses an electron, becoming more positive, and non-metal atoms typically will gain negatively charged electrons become more negative or anions uh, and that's the way i remember it um, if you lose an electron you're essentially becoming more positive if you gain an electron you're essentially becoming more negative and for me that's the easiest way for me to understand um, how all this electron swapping works okay uh, why do they give electrons, why do they lose electrons, and why do they gain electrons? Well, atoms like to be stable. Uh, and by stable, uh, that's defined by having a full outer energy level. Um, they, they tend to like to have their outer energy levels uh, to be full. So in order to do this, they give away or receive electrons uh, in order to achieve this. And I apologize that um, this graphic is uh, relatively, uh, small, but you see if I have a, a neutral metal atom here, like you would see on your regular periodic table, and if it loses an electron, it becomes in essence more positive, and then we, we call it a positive metal ion. If I have a neutral non-metal atom, it tends to want to gain an electron, thereby becoming more negative, or in this case, an anion. And it does this in order, again, to try to become more stable. Um, and it's just like a relationship. They like to be fulfilled on their outer levels. 
and and they give or take in order to try to, to get to that state. We don't need to get into the super duper details of it. Um, but this is the premise of, of these ionic bonds. Okay, uh, this diagram up here is uh, something that's clipped from uh, the old ILM, and I didn't uh, I didn't change I didn't change the diagram because I tend to like this one better. But if we looked at our periodic table um, and these two particular elements here, lithium, uh, which you'll see in the far left hand side of the periodic table in group one. Uh, couple things that we can determine here. Uh, lithium, first of all, being in group one, uh, being in group one tells us that it has one valence electron. So we know that at a, at a bare minimum, the first level uh, in an electron model can hold two electrons, the second one can hold eight, the third one can hold 18, whatever it happens, uh, whatever it happens to be. Uh, in this case, lithium holds one. So in an ideal situation, it would either hold two to be full and, and fulfill that first level, or it would have zero, uh, again, to fulfill its uh, first level. But um, at any rate, it's got that one valence electron. Whereas oxygen, if you looked on your periodic table, is in group six, which tells us that it has six valence electrons. So again, both of them have a propensity for trying to maintain fullness in their, in their outer level here. So in this situation, it's easier for this oxygen atom to gain two more electrons to fill this level than it is to try to give away these six. So uh, in this particular situation, the lithium uh, wants to be happy too. So it says, oh, I'll tell you what, I'll just, I'll just give you my two, my, my electron and I'll give you my electron and we'll fill up this layer and you'll be happy. Uh, you're going to gain these two electrons becoming uh, more negative. Uh, I'm going to lose two electrons essentially becoming more positive and by doing this I'm going to form a new compound called lithium uh, oxide. So this is the this is what we're trying to describe when we're saying that the opposites attract. We started, started out with uh, a couple of neutrals and then they gave up their uh, respective atoms in order to try to get this outer layer uh, to a happy state for it and as a result they've turned themselves into ions. We now have an oxygen uh, ion with the two negative charges you'll see on the periodic table and a lithium ion with the positive one charge which you'll also see on the periodic table. So this goes, uh, this, there's more uh, description in the ILM on pages five, six, and seven. Next, we're going to talk about covalent bonds, uh, and this deals specifically with non-metals or those elements on the right-hand side of that staircase. They do not like to give up their electrons as easily, but they are willing to share them uh, with other non-metals, and when this occurs, we call it a covalent bond. Uh, the following video here is going to show us how water is formed, which is made out of uh, two non-metals, uh, oxygen and hydrogen, and with any luck, this video uh, will work. Of course, it does not work. So that's uh, unfortunate. I don't know if I can make this happen or not. Very disappointing. I will, uh, I don't know what I'll do there. I should have checked that yesterday, I guess. Um, we'll, just, we'll just move on and I'll uh, see if I can attach this video into course content. But basically, it's what I described here in. Uh, in the lithium and oxygen kind of thing, only we're talking about uh, non-metal elements. Okay, the covalent portion uh, is not as obvious as maybe you would like it to be, but the fact that the compound does not contain any metals tells us really need to know. It immediately indicates that first of all, <clears throat> the atoms in the compound will be held together by covalent bonds. If it's not, a combination of two elements that are a metal and a non-metal, you know that it's going to be covalent. That's just a rule, and it's very that's very basic and very simple. Uh, if that's the case, where both of our elements are on the uh, non-metal side of the periodic table, we can say it has covalent bonds, and we can also say that it's molecular rather than atomic. And the major distinction is that the molecules. Typically, we don't talk about their charges, whereas atoms 
uh, we do. So long story short, if you have elements such as we have here, uh, chlorine and phosphorus, if you looked at your periodic table, you'll see that chlorine uh, and phosphorus are both on the right-hand side of that staircase, meaning that they're both non-metals. So if I have two non-metals together, I automatically know that it's a covalent compound and they use covalent bonds. Okay, and so here looking at these, uh, again, if we reflect back on our uh, Lewis dot diagram, we can look at chlorine. Uh, it's in group seven. Group seven tells us that it has seven valence electrons. So we start at the top and we go around distributing them and we end up with uh, some combinations here. We have three lone pairs. These guys are all happy, but we got this one bonding electron. Uh, this bonding electron is going to is going to get involved in some type of a reaction because it wants to be it wants to be full here. Uh, phosphorus, on the other hand, is in group five, so it tells us it has five valence electrons. We draw them around the outside of the element, and we end up with one lone pair and three bonding electrons. So coincidentally, this will work out fine if this chlorine needs one. This chlorine needs one, and this chlorine needs one, and this phosphorus has three available, it's going to want to share. And when it does, it makes a new compound with all the elements uh, happily sharing their valence electrons and having full outer energy levels. And this is really what we're aiming for here. So this is molecular or covalent bonding uh, versus the ionic bonding that we were looking at earlier. Okay, these bonds are held together by something called an electronegativity, or if you, uh, you know, you have a relationship and you think, uh, do we have a, do we have a connection? Is there a, is there a bond there? Do we have energy between us? It's the same kind of thing between compounds, uh, the, the elements within a compound. They have some type of personal magnetism towards each other, and they call it electronegativity. Uh, and the way this electronegativity is shared between the elements, um, reflects in something called polarity. Um, and polarity is just like we normally assume polarity is. If we talk about a magnet, we have a North Pole uh, and a South Pole, uh, and that's that means it's different polarity. Um, if the sharing is equal, uh, and hopefully this will make some sense to you, meaning that the electronegativities are the same, bond is called nonpolar covalent bond. If we look at the the example down here in the diagram, we have two atoms of hydrogen, each have one valence electron, so they share them together as we see down here. And they're the exact same element, so they have the same electronegativities. And if we imagine this as a tug of war, where I have a clone of this guy over here named Henry, and this guy over here named Henry, and they were pulling uh, to try to break these bonds, they would have the exact same equal amount of pull. So there'd be no difference between them, or we say there's no polarity. There's no, this guy is weaker, uh, negative, and this guy is stronger, positive. We don't have that. So we call that nonpolar. In this example, where we have phosphorus trichloride, we have uh, different, and this is where the ILM kind of takes a little bit of a dump here. Uh, we don't give you the, enough information to really tell you, uh, you know, how do I know that these are not pulling straight, uh, but they're pulling at angles? And we don't really get into that. But um, for our purposes here, we're just uh, identifying uh, something that we can tell is symmetrically pulling straight uh, and opposed from each other, and we call that nonpolar. And if that torque or that pull or that tug of war is not fair, such, in, such as it is in this case where we have a chlorine pulling this way, a chlorine pulling this way, and a chlorine pulling this way, and just one phosphorus pulling this way. We call that different electronegativities because they have different characteristics. It's like different people. This is like one big guy and three small guys. We call this uh, polar. So one side here is going to be stronger than the other side. So one will be weaker, we'll call that negative, one will be stronger, we'll call that positive, and as such we have polarity. Um, this is just a one paragraph thing in the ILM, but it is something to kind of understand. Uh, we're not going to get any, any more uh, complicated uh, than this, but it basically has to do with the energy that holds uh, the compound together uh, and whether or not it's balanced, and we call it nonpolar, 
or there's some some type of an imbalance and we call it polar. Next uh, objective here is describing oxidation. Uh, oxidation is a term that's used to describe a reaction in which one substance loses electrons to another. Uh, it does not specifically refer to a reaction in which we're talking about oxygen element, as the name would imply. Uh, it has to do with uh, electrons. Every element uh, has an oxidation number. It is the number that is in the element's top right corner uh, of your periodic table of ions. Uh, if you have the periodic table in front of you, uh, you can see this. Uh, every one of them there has a charge. And if you look at some of the ones in the middle of the periodic table, you'll see that some of them actually have uh, a couple of different charges. So we're going to uh, spend the next uh, few slides here uh, talking about oxidation and where these numbers come from uh, and how we can determine what these, uh, what these numbers are. Um, there's a bunch of rules that are associated with it here. Um, but as a, one of the general rules anyway is that the oxidation number of a monatomic ion, that is one, one element, so in this case sodium or in this case nitrogen, it's the same as its ionic charge number. So if you looked on the periodic table and you found sodium in group one, you'd see that it has a charge uh, of plus one. And so that's its oxidation number is plus one. Nitrogen, uh, same thing, look on the periodic table, it's way over on the right hand side of, uh, in group five. Uh, you'll see that it has a charge of minus three. And that applies for any element on the periodic table as it sits by itself. But of course, uh, life would be too easy if we just asked you things that were sitting uh, by itself. Sometimes we'll ask you to find the ion charge uh, and it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't come out quite that easily. Okay, so in order to determine the ion charge, uh, there's a few things that we have to do. Remember, ions are formed by atoms losing electrons. Okay, cations, which are positive, lose electrons. That's how they become positive. They get rid of some of that negativity and they become more positive. You will find all of these in group 1A to 3A, and there's good connections to make here in the next few slides here. So if you look at group one, two, and three, uh, we spend most of our time focusing on elements in group one, two, and three. Uh, you'll see that they are all positive or cations. Anions, on the other hand, gain electrons or more negatives and uh, become more negative. Uh, they are typically non-metals and they are found in group 5a to 7a so on the left hand side of the periodic table you'll see uh, under the headings 15 16 and 17 which also uh, happens to be group 5 6 and 7 we have a bunch of ions in there that are uh, negatively charged so we use something called the octet rule to determine how many electrons an element loses or gains and again it states that elements lose or gain electrons in order to have eight electrons in their outer energy level and that is not necessarily true all the time because there are such elements uh, like hydrogen and helium uh, which only have one and two electrons so they only have that first energy level um, but for the most part the subjects that we're going to be talking about uh, deal with that second energy level uh, and thus the uh, eight or the octet rule so again uh, looking at um, elements from the regular periodic table. Um, how do we know how they get their charge? Well, we look at what group number they in, uh, how many valence electrons they have, and then is it easier to gain the number of electrons they need to make eight, or is it easier for them to give away a few so that they end up with it? Okay, uh, I said there were exceptions to the rule. Uh, some elements in row one and two, like uh, hydrogen, helium, lithium, and beryllium only have two electrons in the outer level because uh, they can only have uh, two in the first level. But again, we're, we're generally uh, striving for eight. But let's look at, uh, for example, um, sodium. Sodium is in group one, which tells us that it has one valence electron. 
uh, as we see here. And using the octet rule, uh, and don't get too wet wrapped up in saying, well, can't you have 18 out here? Don't worry about that. That's not that important. But what is important is it's a lot easier for this sodium to lose this sole electron on its outer level than it is to gain all the other ones that it would need to fill it. So what it does is it says, go. I don't care, go ahead. That electron disappears. As it leaves, it takes its negativity with it, thereby making the sodium more positive. And we have, as you see here, eight valence electrons. And this is the happy state for an ion. Okay, so we can use the elements group number, as I said earlier, to determine its electron configuration or the number of valence electrons in it, as well as you remember from the previous uh, ILM to figure out its electron configuration, which basically tells us uh, how many electrons it has and in what level they are. Uh, when group 1A to 3 metals form cations, they essentially lose one to three electrons in order to get eight in the outer level, as I showed on the previous sl uh, slide. When group 5A to 7A, the nonmetals form anions, they gain one to three electrons in order to have eight in their outer level. So you could go through, um, you could go through this exercise uh, with any element in group one, two, or three or five, six, and seven, and you would see how they generate those charges, plus one, minus one, uh, plus two, minus two, whatever it might be based on uh, what side of the periodic table we're, we're pulling them from. Okay, so here's a really confusing uh, kind of picture uh, here, but remember, uh, remember what's easiest, gaining or losing, is what it ultimately comes down to. So sodium, again, has one, valence electron in the outer layer and if you remember our electron configurations from the other day uh, that means 1s2 meaning that it's got two electrons in the first level and then the second level it's got uh, th these two plus these six or eight in the second level and then it's got that one lonely valence electron in the third level so it gives up that lonely valence electron in the third level and it then becomes more positive or has a positive one charge and its new oxidation or uh, sorry its new electron configuration uh, is now based on two levels the 1s level and then the two s and p levels together but again counting all the electrons here <coughs> in the valence um, in the other level excuse me eight to be happy from the other side of the uh, periodic table here we have uh, nitrogen, which is in group five, um, having five valence electrons here. So again, it's easier for it to gain three to fill this up than it is to give away five. So that's what it's going to do. It gains three electrons, thereby becoming three electrons more negative, as we see here, and filling its outer level here, as we see, which is now level two with eight electrons and this is a this is a little bit complicated and a little bit confusing for um what is a relatively uh simple concept but again the goal here is getting eight in this outer level and what electron changing happens and how we how we notate it so you'll see now uh, that these numbers represent the periodic table of ions, uh, whereas these were as they existed as elements. Okay, electron configuration cheating. So here's a little uh, chart that helps you cheat uh, for electron configuration. And this is handy for this ILM because we tend to grab most of our compounds um, using elements out of these groups. So group 1A, 2A, 3A, if you were to look at your periodic table, you would see have respond uh, corresponding charges of plus one plus two and plus three so that's super easy uh, to remember one two three one two three uh, other side of the periodic table on the non-metal side we have five six and seven a and they have respective charges of minus three minus two and minus one and you can look on the periodic table and you can verify that um, you can get more complicated uh, figuring that out if you want. The table's the easiest way to do it, but 
Um, for group five, six, a basically you subtract eight from the group number. So eight, uh, five minus eight will give you minus three. Uh, six minus eight will give you minus two. Seven minus eight will give you minus one. So you can get the ion charge that way as well. But generally using the periodic table and, and this little table here is all you will really need. Okay, so let's see what the heck this looks like. Uh, finally, uh, getting to some type of an exercise here after all of these, um, all of these uh, theoretical uh, electron swapping scenarios. So note, these are all single element ions. Uh, our life is not gonna be so simple. We are ultimately building up to uh, something like this, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But let's just pause for a second. Uh, and see what they're asking us to do here on page 15. So they're saying, we wanna know what the element name is, what its symbol, what group number it is, and what its ion symbol is going to be. So if we looked at sulfur uh, on the periodic table here, it's in group six. That means that it has, uh, it's in group 6A, which means that it has six electrons in its valence uh, level. Uh, if it's got six and it really wants to be happy at eight, the likelihood, likelihood is that it's going to try to gain the remaining two electrons. So if it does gain two electrons, which it does, it becomes more negative by a factor of two, and we write it as S minus two, and that is what is represented on the periodic uh, table of ions. Lithium, uh, group 1A, tells us that it has one electron, uh, and in this case, it's going to uh, lose that one electron and in doing that becoming more positive or positive by one and its ionic symbol is going to be Li plus one. So I'm not going to go through the uh, rest of them here but that is uh, that is what's going on and that is the that's the first step that's baby step number one uh, right there and we're going to jump right into baby step number two um, when we talk about multiple element ions, and these are called polyatomic ions, and you see we have chlorine here uh, combining with oxygen, and it's got a charge, and we can calculate the oxidation number of each component uh, in one of these ions, and this is the major uh, uh, practical uh, examples of what we're trying to achieve with this ion. Is how do we how do we end up writing all these formulas, uh, and it all comes down to electron swapping uh, and how they make their bonds. So a lot of theory to get to uh, something that um, in its practice is actually relatively simple. Okay, so let's look at uh, these polyatomic ions and compounds and they're, they're based on seven rules. Um, the good news is that the majority of the work that we do um, doesn't use all of these rules. We'll use one or two of these rules mostly. Uh, and again, this is an introductory uh, type chemistry course that just kind of gives us a background uh, on how different things join up together so that we can understand the reactions uh, that we're measuring uh, when, we're, when we're dealing with analyzers later. So seven rules. The sum of every element's oxidation number in a compound is zero. And don't be too worried about these rules. Um, at the moment because they really mean nothing to you until you get a chance to uh, apply them in some practical way, but that is coming, don't you worry. Uh, elements such as sulfur, iron, and oxygen have an, uh, an oxidation number of zero. So um, things that are alone have oxidation numbers of zero. We'll, this will make more sense once you get some practical uh, examples. The ions overall ionic charge equals the sum of every atom in the oxidation number of a polyatomic ion. Again, will make sense once we do it. Elements in group 1a and 2a in the periodic table generally have the oxidation numbers shown in table 3. And again, we don't use most of these rules, but these are the rules that come into play. Silver and zinc have oxidation numbers of plus 1 and plus 2 respectively. Oxidations, ox oxidation number, sorry, oxygens, oxidation number is minus 2 when found in a compound or polyatomic ion. This is probably the most significant rule out of the seven that we're gonna read you here. Uh, this one comes into play in just about everything uh, you're going to determine moving forward. Uh, number seven, use a charge uh, in table three. 
when group 7A elements are in a compound containing a single cation and anion. Again, doesn't mean a whole lot until you get it to put into practice. Um, but basically, the two big ones out of this list are oxygen. Oxidation number is minus two when in a compound or polyatomic ion. And moving forward, this is all we're going to be talking about. So it's going to be minus two 99.9% .9 of the time. Anything in a formula by itself, just standing there by itself, an S by itself, uh, an Fe by itself, an O by itself, has an oxidation number of zero. Okay, let's see if we can apply this and make a little more sense. Okay, here's an example. <clears throat> Calculate manganese's oxidation number in the polyatomic compound potassium permanganate. So there's a bunch of stuff going on here uh, that we need to look at and we need to address. So the first most important thing here is that this is a chemical formula in which there is no charge here. Okay, and that is significant because in the next example, we'll look at one that does have a charge here. So let's apply these rules. This compound has no charge. Therefore, the sum of the oxidation numbers must be zero. Okay, uh, or if that's a rule in here somewhere. Uh, the sum of every element's oxidation number in a compound is zero. So that's rule one. So now we apply the rules. Uh, as as we know them. So in this particular example, we have to look at the elements in the compound and if there's any rules that are associated with them. So what you have to look at are any of these in group one, two, three, five, six, or seven, because that would mean that little table comes into play. Are any of these oxygen? Because there's that rule for oxygen and that comes into play. So that's the ones that are specific to this question. So for example, Potassium has an oxidation number of plus one because it's in group 1A, and that applies to rule number four. Rule four says groups 1A and 2A in the periodic table, oops, generally have the oxidation numbers shown in table three, which happens to be the oxidation numbers that is on the periodic table. So if you were to look at potassium on the periodic table in group one, you would see that it has a plus one charge. So that's its oxidation number. Oxygen in a compound, which is rule number six, has an oxidation number of minus two. So that's a rule. So we have to use it. Manganese uh, doesn't have a rule. It's somewhere. Where the heck is manganese? It's in the middle of the periodic table there somewhere, isn't it? Oh, can't even see it. It's in group seven, uh, in 7B, actually in the middle of the periodic table. So there's no rule for manganese. So easy cheat here is, generally speaking, if it says calculate this element, this element doesn't have a rule. That's why you have to calculate it based on the other two elements or the other three elements that do have the rules. Okay, so again, potassium plus one, oxygen in a compound is two. From this, we can then derive the net charge of manganese. So the overall charge is equal to the oxidation number of the potassium plus the oxidation number of the manganese plus the oxidation number of the oxygen as we apply the rules to them. So first, potassium, due to the rule, has a charge of plus, run, uh, plus one. Manganese has no rule, so we're trying to figure it out. And oxygen has a rule that says oxygen is minus two. From the formula up here, this tells us again the ratio, four oxygens, one manganese, one potassium. So we have to do four times minus two, which is minus eight. Therefore, overall charge is gonna be plus one, plus a minus eight, and manganese, which I should have had written in here, which means that overall, we're gonna get add these together. That gives us minus seven plus manganese, we do a plus seven here and plus seven here, and that tells us that manganese's oxidation number is plus seven. Net charge is zero. Okay, this is based on a, on a zero charge. So I understand that that's a little bit complicating. Uh, once you run, run through a few of these, it won't be bad. Uh, again, most of them are going to have an oxygen in it. All you have to be sure of is make sure that you get the multiplication of 
the, the, the recipe number for the amount of oxygens in there. And then look for elements that fall in, into the rules, group one, two, or three, five, six, or seven. Uh, that's most of the exercise of this ILM. Okay, next example, we're gonna look at one that does have a charge here. So you'll see this has a minus two charge. It should be a little bit tighter up here, but this is the way I can write it. So that's the way it is. Because it has a charge, we know that it's an ion. Uh, because it's got more than one element in it, we also know it's a polyatomic compound or a polyatomic ion. Uh, and in this case here, the sum of the oxidation numbers must also be minus two. Is there a rule that says that? I can't remember. It says here, I believe the ions overall ionic charge equals the sum of every atom in the oxidation number of a polyatomic ion. So in this case, the sum of all the atoms is going to equal minus two. And that's the math that we're going to look at here. So what rules do we have? We know that our overall charge has to equal minus two. And it's going to be comprised of chlorines, oxidation number, two of them, and oxygens, oxidation number, seven of them. So two times chlorine plus seven times oxygen. We don't know chlorine. Um, because it's uh, it's asking us in this case here, but we do know for sure oxygen. Oxygen is always minus two. That's this is really the golden uh, the golden coupon is oxygen. Really, it's almost in every single one. So seven times two and it's minus fourteen, uh, which is a result of the seven oxygens each having a minus two charge, and then we have two times chlorine. So if we take this minus fourteen and we do plus 14 here, and we do plus 14 over here. That gets rid of this. That makes this a positive 12. This positive 12 is equal to two chlorines. So then we divide that by two, and we can say that each chlorine is worth positive six. And in this particular formula, chlorine's oxidation number is plus six. Now, usually someone would pop their hands up and say, well, According to the periodic table, uh, chlorine is in group seven and it has a negative charge of negative one. Why isn't it that? Uh, don't ask that question. It's above your pay grade. Um, and the answer, long story short, is that it has to equal this negative two. So in order to do that, it has to be plus six. And this is as complicated as it gets. Uh, you'll do a couple more examples of this, some with charges, some without charges. Uh, but again, it's just applying uh, it's just applying these rules where rules are, are known to apply. And then if you don't know the rule, that's probably the one you're going to find, uh, you're being asked to find. Okay, variable oxidation numbers. Again, I mentioned uh, looking in the middle of the periodic table here in this transition metal area. Uh, manganese, for example, um, fell into that category here. Many transition metals and non-metals have more than one oxidation number. So that answers your question about chlorine from the previous slide uh, here. Depending on the compound or ion they're in, we're not getting into it much any deeper than that. So this is the only statement you really need to worry about. It just depends. Okay, luckily, we're not training you to be chemists. That's all you need to know about that. Um, you will be able to, by the time we're done this, uh, be able to determine which one of the two manganeses it is. Is it the two plus or the four plus? Um, but there's just exceptions to the rule. And you'll see there's lots of exceptions to the rule uh, in chemistry. All righty. So this gets us, this is a long and winding road to getting us to really how do you write chemical formulas. So we're going to look here quickly at monatomic and polyatomic ions, of which we've already looked at them before. Uh, we learned that ions have a charge, plus or minus. When we make a polyatomic ion, we must be able to write the formula correctly. This is one of the main objectives of this ILM. The resulting ionic compound will not have a charge assigned to it anymore. Uh, it will look at something like this. This is an example of taking calcium, which has a plus two charge, and bromine, which, which has a minus one charge, and they join together and they create a new polyatomic ion called calcium bromide, and it looks like this. How do we get that? 
it's pretty easy. There's only a couple rules. First, you write the cation first, so the positive element first, in this case calcium, so CABR, and you write the second one next, and then you simple crisscross. This is what happened here is we just crisscross. So this two goes down behind the B right there. This one goes down in front of the A right here and apply second rule. Do not write a subscript of one. So really this is CA1BR2 if we do our crisscross, but we don't write the ones. So that's really what we're culminating in here is this. Okay, CA is a cation plus two, BR is a negative one, which we don't write. We do crisscross applesauce and we get CABR2. This two comes over here, this one comes over here. Okay, naming ionic compounds is uh, based on the number of elements in them. Uh, binary means two, binary ionic, then we'll have one metal and one non-metal. Remember, in order to be ionic, it has to have one of each. Ternary have three or more elements, uh, and at least one of them is generally polyatomic. Uh, this is a good example here because we refer to these polyatomic ions a lot. There's a bunch of them that are very common, and they are listed on your periodic table of ions in a large box at the top. Right here, polyatomic ions. These are the most common ones, and we will be using this most of the time okay so if you see something looking funky like this good chance you're going to find it in that polyatomic ion table at the top of the ionic uh, element sheet okay there is no overall charge on an ionic compound uh the positives and negatives balance out so we'll look at how we uh how we get these formulas made and how we name them uh how we make a name from a formula and a formula from a name <clears throat> okay, again, how do we do this? Crisscross applesauce is the magic rule here. Write the cation first or the positive element first. Give the anion the element's root name with IDEN. So this is the general rule. It's going to apply from, from now on. So here I take sodium and chlorine and I crisscross the applesauce. Uh, they're both plus one, so we don't see either of those ones. And then it becomes not sodium chlorine as the name, it's sodium chloride. Once they've joined, the INE disappears and the IDE comes into play. Don't worry about it any more deeply than that. Just know that when you join them, the INE disappears and the IDE comes into play. So sodium chloride, not sodium chlorine. Oxygen would then be oxide. Nitrogen would be nitride, bromine would be bromide, fluorine would be fluoride. Okay, um, also reduce to lowest common denominators. So in this case here you see Mg is a two charge, uh, sulfur has a two charge. If you crisscross them, our formula would be Mg2S2. Uh, we eliminate uh, lowest common denominator here in two and we just write it as Mgs. This example here, uh, probably more typical, where they're different. Uh, Li with a one charge, O with a two negative charge, crisscross applesauce, we get Li2O. And again, we don't write the one. So uh, a lot of build up to this, um, but this is where we're this is where we're heading. Okay, hydrogen we'll mention really quickly, specifically because uh, if you haven't noticed, it happens to appear on both sides of the periodic table of ions uh, because it can be a metal or non-metal this isn't going to affect our life very much but it is important that you do know this um, it is known as a hydride uh, when it gains an electron and it becomes an anion and uh, we have a hydrogen ion or uh, oh my goodness blanking out here uh, a hydrogen ion with a positive charge as it loses uh, an electron becomes a cation. So hydrogen is a little bit unique. Good news is, is we almost use exclusively the positive uh, hydrogen ion or hydronium, it's often called. And it's called hydronium uh, when we deal with it in liquid analyzers. 
Okay, ternary ionic compounds. This is the bulk of our work again as we move forward here, again, containing at least three different elements, uh, and two of them form a polyatomic ion. So in this case, we have the three elements, uh, elements calcium, uh, carbon, and oxygen. These two form together to make a polyatomic ion that you can find in the top of your periodic table of ions called carbonate. And when we take the charges for each of these uh, uh, compounds or elements here in this case again the same rule applies crisscross applesauce uh, that two comes down here this two comes over here but because they're both twos they disappear and we write it like we see here okay here is again our common polyatomic uh, ions uh, these are most of the ones that we deal with in the ILM uh, again found at the top of the periodic table here so hydroxide, negatively charged, uh, anion, anion, nitrate, uh, sulfate, carbonate, phosphate, and ammonium. Uh, the only one here that's positive or a cation. Okay, so using the above examples, we can drive the following things. Uh, CaCO3, the formula breaks down into uh, a positive two calcium and a negative two carbonate. And when we crisscross, like we saw in the previous slide, um, they cancel out. All right, so that's uh, named a formula. Formula to name. We're expected to be able to go both ways. So ammonium chloride tells us that we are going to be using uh, the polyatomic compound called ammonium, and we are going to be using <coughs> the ion called chloride. <coughs> Ammonium is one of the few positive um, ions in the upper table. <clears throat> That's where you'll find it, NH4 with a plus one charge. Chlorine, as you can see, has a negative one charge. We do our crisscross applesauce, and this is how it is written. <clears throat> Magnesium nitrate uh, from the periodic table. Magnesium in group two has a plus two charge. Nitrate from the table of polyatomic ions, again, you can see has a negative one charge. Uh, we do our crisscross applesauce, and this is where we introduce something new. Um, the two from over here can't just go right beside this three. Uh, so we have to put this polyatomic in brackets. And the two from the magnesium comes on the outside of this, and the one from the uh, nitrate goes over here, and we don't write it. But basically, this is telling us in this recipe that we have one portion of magnesium and two portions of this. So this is like a mixture of salt and sugar, for example, when we're making cookies. This is our flour, one part of flour to two parts of this salt and sugar combination. Okay, and in this salt and sugar combination, there is one part salt and three parts sugar. But that's what the numbers uh, here represent. So when you have a polyatomic that has another uh, number down here, you just got to put the brackets around it uh, before you do your crisscrossing. Okay, so an example here. Um, this is from the ILM. I wasn't going to do this, but I thought um, a lot of the stuff we talked about is very confusing. Uh, and again, I said the practical exercise is actually quite easy. So I thought I'd walk through just one of them here. So uh, write each ionic compound's formula by completing, by completing the four steps. Okay, so write each element symbol using table eight in the appendix. So you can use that or you can use a periodic table, whatever you like. Find each ion's oxidation number with figure seven and table three, and then write the symbols out and put the cation first. And then use the crossover rule to find the smallest uh, common denominator numbered scripts for the compound. So in this case, uh, we'll have lithium. We look at the uh, element symbol for lithium is Li. The element symbol uh, for fluorine uh, is F. Okay, find each ion's oxidation number using figure 17 in table three. Well, Li is in group one. Uh, and there's a rule that says if it's in group one, two, or three, it's probably its charge. And if it's in group five, six, or seven, it's also probably its charge. So in this case, lithium is in group one with a plus one charge, and fluorine is in group seven with a minus one charge. 
So you would write this Li plus one and F minus one. Third, write the symbols out and put the cation first. So LIF and then uh, cation, the positive one first, negative one second. Then use the crossover rule. And as you'll see here, if we use a crossover rule, it's one and one. We don't write them. And that's how it works. So pretty long and windy road to get us down to something that is uh, simple, hopefully. So that is the end of part A. Um, I'm not sure if this video works either. I'm going to say probably not. But let's see if we can make it work. And we're lucky. We are not lucky. All right. I will. Uh, I will refresh the videos uh, in the powerpoints, and I'll update the powerpoint in the uh, course content, uh, so that when you want to look at it later, the videos uh, will be here. But that is the long, drawn out. Uh, first ILM in inorganic compounds. And I do apologize that it, it, it's maybe uh, a little bit confusing, uh, especially for those of you who have done it before. Um, you'll probably go, wow, that's a, that's a lot of talking for um, what in practical application is really not that difficult. So I hope you feel that way when you're done. Um, again, if you have any questions, do not uh, hesitate to uh, reach out to me through email and uh, we can figure it out.